Thanks. Cool. Well, welcome everybody for joining. Uh, there might be a few people trickling in. I'll keep an eye on the chat for you, Ben, and also the attendance. But uh, welcome everybody for this topic. And uh, we meet every, I think it's every second Tuesday of the month. So after this, we'll go ahead and get that out there. And this will be recorded. So if you miss anything or would like to double check, uh, feel free to check out our YouTube channel. And we'll be doing a giveaway at the end. With that, Ben, I will hand it over to you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Alec. And let me find my team's window. And I can share. Well, let's just share the screen. Only let's share the other screen because there we'll share that screen. That one will work a little bit better. Uh, so thanks for having me, Alec. Um, I don't have many slides. I was going to do this very demo heavy. I don't like slides, so I'm not even going to put PowerPoint into sharing mode. Uh, but who am I? I'm a Microsoft Cloud Consultant, so I do both Azure and Microsoft 365. And as you may have noticed from the topic, when Alec asked me for the um, kind of a session, a user group topic, I had Microsoft 365 in the brain. I was preparing for Microsoft 365 conference um, and some sessions uh, next week. And I sent him over a Microsoft 365 session. And he was like, OK, that sounds good. Last night, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should have done something more Azure focused. So we're still doing Microsoft 365. Um, there are some tie-ins into Azure. There are some interesting crossovers when it comes to some of the data loss prevention stuff. Um, with Teams and SharePoint, if you are all Azure admins, Azure devs, uh, some of this stuff may be interesting to you as well in terms of what you can do with DLP to even help protect some of your Azure stuff. So we'll talk about that. If you have any questions, happy to answer questions, dive into questions. Uh, I am a newly minted Microsoft MVP as of the beginning of this year, so a few months now. Um, Again, I do stuff with Azure, with Microsoft 365, security. So I've gone and taken a bunch of certifications just for the fun of it. Uh, also Microsoft certified trainer for a few years. Uh, I do have four kids, all ages 10 and under. They are around the house. So if you hear someone come flying into my office, um, it's just one of the kids. My wife homeschools them all. So we all hang out at home all day, every day together. Um, because, oh, also co-host the podcast. So I have a podcast with a friend of mine here in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Scott Hogue, the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro podcast. And kind of in the whole Microsoft 365 Azure vein, we talk all about uh, those two topics, all about the Microsoft Cloud, really from an admin IT Pro perspective. Um, we're up to episode 350 two now I think because we actually recorded one this morning uh, so if you want to go check out that uh, I can throw some links out there to uh, the podcast if you have any topics you want to hear about on it feel free to let me know I'm always happy to uh, dive into something new on the podcast so diving into the topic to data loss prevention when it comes to this was geared a little bit more SharePoint, Teams, Microsoft 365, and I'll show you where it kind of ties over to Azure. But one of the things you care about, even if you are an admin in your organization, you care about security. And this could tie into some of the uh, Azure resources you have. If you're trying to protect certain intellectual property from going out through Exchange or through going on in Teams conversations, um, you want to help prevent 
certain data breaches. Maybe it's a connection string to one of your Azure storage accounts, a uh, connection string to a SQL server. Um, that type of information falls into data loss prevention when it comes to your organization, your different environments. Uh, data exfiltration, someone gets into your environment and wants to dump out a bunch of data. Uh, maybe they want to throw a bunch of files in SharePoint, share them out through SharePoint to get it out, send a bunch of emails with a bunch of data from your environment. Uh, lots of different security benefits to DLP. Um, and it's something that I've seen a lot of people don't necessarily think about. When a lot of people think DLP, they think more on the compliance side of things. Um, HIPAA, PII, PCI, uh, all the regulatory data privacy type topics. Uh, when it comes to security, they forget about that just as important to um, your environment as compliance is securing it, not just keeping people out, not just having strong passwords and MFA and firewalls and uh, all of those security features, but what happens if somebody does get in? Are there things that I can do to help keep my data in my environment and keep it from getting out to the outside? So that's where we're going to look at DLP. And one of those areas where, again, I think people forget about DLP as a security benefit and they focus just on the compliance side of things. Um, so what are we going to look at? We are going to spend a bunch of time in the Compliance Center in Microsoft 365. So if you've never seen that, you'll get to take a look at that. Uh, and with that is purview. And this is where you do get some crossover. If you've been in Azure for a while, you may have seen purview in Azure and some of the purview functionality through, um, through Azure and what you can do there. There are some there's some intersection between the purview in Azure and between purview in Microsoft 365 in terms of labeling and in terms of data classification. So we're going to take a look at data classification, some of the classification labels that are built into Microsoft 365, built into Azure, uh, how you can create some of your own data classification labels. Uh, different features and functionalities around data classification. We'll take a look at information protection. Uh, once you classify this different data, how do you go in and actually set up different information protection policies to help keep that data secure? And then finally, data loss prevention. So all three, four of these things, the classification, the information protection, the data loss prevention policies and how they work, all are kind of interrelated to each other. So I was sitting down and trying to think about what order to do this in because inevitably one of them leads to another one, leads to another one of them. So we'll just kind of dive in and start exploring this. Uh, if you do have questions as we go, uh, feel free to come off mute. I don't know, there's nine people here. Um, feel free to come off mute and just interrupt me. Uh, don't necessarily worry about raising your hand. It's a small group. I love answering questions. If you have a particular solution you're trying to solve, uh, diving into that. So um, again, don't feel like you have to wait with questions till the end or raise your hand if I don't notice it, or if you're more comfortable, throw it in the chat. I have the chat up here too, so I'll try to keep an eye on that. So when it comes to data loss prevention, I was playing in the Azure portal with Purview. Um, but from a Microsoft 365 perspective, you have your Compliance Center. Um, and while I said this is a security aspect, and we'll kind of look at it a little bit more from a security aspect today, uh, it is all in the Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. Um, and starting off with that, uh, Let's start off taking a look at data classification. What is that information you want to protect? So in this case, this is going to give me my tenant, gives me a snapshot of all of the different sensitive information 
different labels that are in my environment. And this is where you can even start to see this is not just HIPAA related. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch of source code that has been detected in my SharePoint environment. Maybe it's in Teams, maybe it's in Outlook. Uh, different, um, there are some legal affairs, some agreements, IP addresses, uh, different things related to finance. So one thing you can do when, if you wanna see just what is in your environment, one of the things are these trainable classifiers where you can have different data classification and get a good snapshot of what type of information is even in my environment from different classifiers. This gets into some of the sensitive information types, uh, full names, physical addresses. This is a little bit more compliance related, um, but as we'll see, it could also be related to intellectual property or um, development, different Azure things. Um, and then just a few more charts that you can see. Most of my data is actually picked up out of Exchange where I have some of those sensitivity labels applied, uh, some stuff in SharePoint, a few things in OneDrive. Um, so it just gives you a good overview. But what are these different classifiers? We saw the trainable classifiers come up. And we'll start with these. By default, Microsoft includes a bunch of different classifiers that they have built that are have certain rules around them um, to detect what type of data is this? What type of categories of content are spread out across my organization? And there's a bunch of them in here. You see 93 of them. Some of these are, uh, again, going to be a little bit more privacy related, maybe something like budgets or bank statements. But you do start getting some of these other ones where it is uh, IP, where maybe it's certain types of intellectual property that it is detecting across your organization. Uh, and we'll see Compliance Center can be notoriously slow to load at times. So hopefully it'll pull up here in a moment. If not, we'll go try another one. There it goes. Um, so you can see this has 652 total matches. We can start diving through these and see what are these items that were matched. I have a bunch of things in Exchange and in SharePoint and actually drill through um, what are these different resources that got picked up. They're in a SharePoint site. Um, I think this is a safe SharePoint site. Uh, this is going to be different service agreements, uh, different. Um, this was primarily picking up a bunch of different service agreements that I had in there from different clients that I've worked with. Uh, so picking up that as different information protection, different classifiers that it wants to protect. If we dive in through another one, we could start digging through all these different uh, classifications of data that exist within our environment. Um, and it wants to be really slow to load everything today for me. Uh, if you have other classifications you want to make, other things you want to train, you can also go in and create your own. You don't just have to use the ones that Microsoft has selected for you. Uh, and if this comes up, we could go look at one of those or we'll just keep jumping on because we don't want to sit here and spend half our time watching Microsoft's progress bars. There it goes. Um, yeah, different things around profanity, project documents, safety records. So this is going to be, uh, think of these as much almost broader cat categories. This is going to take a bunch of different aspects of certain content and try to figure out, is this a network design file um, based on certain content that's in it? Or is this an uh, invoice based on the content that's in it? So it's taking a document and saying, what type of document is this? 
how is this document or this file or this email actually going to be classified from the perspective of that entire document? Uh, the next thing you have is sensitive information types. So this starts getting down now to what is the information, what type of information is in that document? Maybe this invoice is that certain classifier, but within an invoice, maybe you have routing numbers or it picks up a bank account number. Um, we looked at the trainable classifiers and maybe you have network diagrams in your environment well, or a network design file. What might be an indication that it's a network design file? Might be that it picked up uh, an IP address within the document. So these sensitive information types are what types of content are within your uh, certain file, your email. Again, that qualifies it as a certain type of file. And this is where if you're using some of your Azure documentation or you inadvertently maybe put an IP address in or a storage account key for Azure storage, Microsoft has built in a lot of these different sensitive information types for different types of Azure resources. Again, all those different storage account keys. Um, there is sensitive information types now for credentials. Uh, so Azure AD user credentials, user login credentials. If you're sitting in that IT management standpoint, you want to make sure you know people aren't uh, having chats and sharing their user credentials or login credentials within a team's chat or you have people that are storing all of your account credentials for azure for other third-party services that you use uh, various types of things in a sharepoint site or in a onedrive site uh, i was working with one uh security breach it's a few months ago now where an account was compromised Someone got in to their SharePoint environment and found a Excel spreadsheet that someone in HR marketing had created that had all of the usernames and passwords for third party services that they used. Uh, and that Excel file was compromised in that breach. If they had been looking for some of these sensitive information types, maybe they still would have gotten in, they could have found the file, they could have taken a screenshot of it, um, done stuff like that. But if you start putting that DLP policy in place, you start looking for these sensitive information types, uh, something like that, it makes it at least a little bit harder for it to be uh, compromised, to be uh, exfiltrated from within your organization. Uh, if you have other sensitive information types that you want, maybe you're looking for ones, Microsoft doesn't have one in here, you can always go in and create additional sensitive information types. So this is a demo information type. It needs a description. And then you can go in and start defining different patterns. Uh, how do you detect this particular sensitive information type? Is it based on regular expressions, keywords, uh, different functions within your environment uh, around credit cards? Um, what is that primary element? Is that primary element a certain keyword or a certain regular expression? Character proximity, how close is this primary element to any of the supporting elements? If I have CC and then within two spaces, I have something that looks like a credit card number. Um, maybe my primary element is looking for CC or looking for credit card, or maybe the primary element is a credit card number. And if I have something that maybe indicates that that might be a credit card, again, a certain label, a certain acronym for credit cards, uh, that could be the supporting element. So this goes in and creates how, what is the sensitive information type? Just a note too for everybody here. Um, yeah. These sensitive, in, in, I'm sure you can get this, but these these sensitive info types are applied through policies that can be scoped to different groups. So you can really like make these very 
granular and then apply them to like different groups of people who are working with different stuff or you can do it across the organization but just a, a note to keep in, in mind there that that's why it, it can get so granular and it should be yeah and they're super powerful in how you scope it and this is actually something i was looking at too is as you go in and start creating these different sensitive information types um in defining them if you're doing something over in Azure and looking at Azure Purview, Microsoft has uh, started to unify these. They have the unified labeling, the sensitive information types, where over here in Purview in Azure, if you're going in and messing with like your Azure subscription over here, uh, we'll go into one of my demos, this one I have a SQL database in. I can actually go start diving into my database tables now. And this particular one looks at exchange growth. And we can drive down into the schema. You'll actually see I have a classification here for a user, UPN, not really an email address. It's close enough. Um, but you can go into these different databases, different uh, storage accounts, those different uh, schematized resources that you have in Azure and start using those same classifications of sensitive information, uh, the full names, the physical addresses, the, um, I don't know if account keys, bank account numbers is in here. This one isn't pulling up some of the Azure ones. Um, but go in and start using some of the same classification when you start building out your Azure resources that you may use in Microsoft 365. So as you're working now with uh, your Azure data, you start getting some of those reports, those data maps, you can start setting up data policies, all using the same labels, the same uh, sensitivity, uh, sensitive information types, all of those that you're using in Microsoft 365. So you can start getting that unified data management across everything, both Azure and Microsoft 365. And this, uh, that that window you were looking at there, yep. if you go back to that, that's in, is that in the Purview Center now? Or I, I, I don't want to say too much, but I work <laughs> in GCCH and the portals kind of ah. behind the times. Uh, so uh, this one's a little unfamiliar to me. This is in Purview or this is in Azure? That this, this is one you're looking at. Yes. How's that? <laughs> um, it's in Azure. So this is an Azure one. So if I would go to my Azure portal. Uh, and they're typical Microsoft. They're always messing with the portal. Always. But if you go look for your purview account, you can go in and create a purview account. And then, of course, they have the new purview portal that you can go and check out. So this one actually redirects you over to that purview.microsoft.com portal. Um, so this is really more, I would say it's more of an Azure portal than Microsoft 365. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on the 365 one mostly. So. Okay. So yeah, you can go into this Purview account here and start looking through it, but all the management for it is done over on purview.microsoft.com. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you've been on the Microsoft 365, I'll show you here in a minute uh, where that where you start publishing those and even where you see some of the um, stuff and you may recognize it too like if you've ever seen uh when we get into creating the um some of the information protection and some of the data loss where you have that checkbox for the schematized assets um that kind of pushes some of that stuff over into azure A uh, couple other things like this content explorer, this is similar to what we looked at when we went into the uh, trainable classifiers, only it gives you a little bit more of an ability to really dive down through the sensitive information type. So this is not those trainable classifiers, but like IP addresses. 
I have what appears to be almost 1,500 IP addresses across different um, types of data within my environment. Uh, some of these could be false positives. Um, most of them are me and Microsoft broke it. But you could go through this Content Explorer and start looking through, are people actually putting additional information um, or sensitive information within files or within emails that I don't want to and dive through which sites are guilty of this. Is HR guilty of putting a bunch of social security numbers within their SharePoint site? Uh, and our policy says no social security numbers in SharePoint or, and this is where your data loss prevention starts coming in, do I need to go in and start setting policies for HR, for social security numbers to help protect that data within my HR SharePoint site. Uh, Activity Explorer, a similar type of view, only it deals more with what activities are, view, are being done. So Content Explorer is what's there, what's within my content that's already out there. Activity Explorer is what are people doing and are they doing stuff with certain sensitivity labels? So are people removing sensitivity labels? Um, are they being applied, changed, removed? What files are being created that contain sensitive information types? Um, and then what are those sensitive information types? So going in and narrowing down who's actually creating all of these files that maybe have my IP addresses in them, or who's creating all these files and forgetting to take storage account uh, keys, or sending out a bunch of emails that have Azure AD credentials in them. Uh, this Activity Explorer is going to let you go through and start filtering out um, who's doing what, what they're doing, when are they doing it, is it stuff being created? This is primarily all files being modified, updated uh, within my environment. Uh, so now we have our data classification. This is how do we go in and classify what types of data I have, what types of data do I deem sensitive? If we go down to our information protection, we can start getting into, now that we have these different types of sensitive information, how do we want to go about starting to protect some of that sensitive information? Uh, much like the data classification, the overview is going to give you a report. And I don't use a ton of sensitivity labels in my environment. I probably should use more. But this is going to give me what are those sensitivity labels that are applied. So data classifications are how do you define a social security number or how do you define a credit card number? How do you define a storage account number? Sensitivity labels are going to be labels that users can go in and apply and essentially say, I'm creating this network diagram. I'm going to store it in SharePoint or I'm going to email it to somebody. This is a internal diagram. Nobody should be able to share this externally, or this is a client file. Uh, maybe this is a confidential file. Uh, labels are going to help you classify what these different types of content are. So they're kind of loosely related to sensitive information types. You can go in and you'll see this auto labeling, and this is where they start overlapping a little bit, is go in and actually automatically label uh, SharePoint files, automatically label emails based on one of those sensitive information types that we've created or one of those classifiers that we have within our environment. Uh, if you're not going to auto label, you can just go in and manually create labels. So this is a confidential file. And we can display it as confidential. Just put same description for everything. If you want to give the label a color, uh, bright red, 
I already have that confidential. Do a demo. And a demo. Uh, and now you can go in and say, what is the scope of this label? Well, where can people actually use this label? Can they use it to label their files in Word or Excel or PowerPoint, whatever those files are? Do you want them to be able to label emails as a confidential email? Uh, meetings, this is gonna relate to Teams and calendar events, and you can start setting up labels of this meeting is a confidential meeting, this is an internal meeting only, so we're going to put certain policies and certain restrictions in place around what can or can't be done in this meeting, what can be done in meeting chats, can it be recorded, is it watermarked, um, all the different types of controls around that. You can also set different labels on groups and SharePoint sites, and when you think groups, also think teams. Um, this is the IT team, and we want to label the IT team as internal only, or this is a client site or a client team that we're going to collaborate with a client in. Uh, in we can label this as a client team. In yeah, commercial, do you still have to do all the PowerShell commands to enable groups and sites for labels on a new tenant, or did they make it so that's automatic now? Last I have seen, it's still all the PowerShell commands to enable it. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen that it's automatic. Um, and that is a good point. This groups and sites, and I actually have a YouTube video out there somewhere. Um, you do? I would love to have that because every time I have to do it, I have to reinvent the wheel on that one. I don't know why. It seems like it changes every time, so I can't keep one <laughs> script on it. Here you go. This is accurate as um, far as I know. Do, 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 do. This one right here. As far as I know, this has not changed at all. Okay. Maybe no. I'm just doing something wrong. Yeah, it should be, and I tried to simplify it. Um, so hopefully it's pretty straightforward. And if you run into any issues with it, um, let me know. I'll throw that link okay. in the chat. I'll, for I'll, you I'll, pro I'll probably do it on a test tenant tonight, just another <laughs> one, just to see if it works. And it's always annoying because when you do it, you have to wait like 24 hours for it to replicate. Yes, it does take a little bit for it to show up. Um, but yeah, that is a good point that this groups and sites, it doesn't um, automatically, uh, it just doesn't work out of the box. Um, and the schematized data assets. So this is where we talked about showing these in like the purview data map over in this portal over here is this data map as you go through and start looking through, and I haven't gone through adding collections and all of that, but being able to start using these uh, labels within Purview is when you create a new label, uh, pushing it out to those schematized data assets, and you'll see, you can use it SQL, Azure SQL, Synapse, Cosmos, um, even AWS, uh, RDS, different areas that this label can be used as well within your Azure environment if you want to start labeling those assets as well. Uh, based on what you select here, as you keep going, you'll get a lot more options in here. So this is going to be items, emails, uh, files. Um, maybe you want to protect your Teams meetings and chats. I use this one a lot for the encryption around if there is financial information in an email, go ahead and automatically encrypt that email and send it as an encrypted item. You could very easily do the same thing for uh, if you pick up credentials in an email or something else. But this is going to be now which protection settings do I want to enforce as I label items? And this will send you down a whole bunch of sub categories uh, within these items is let's go ahead and set up a encryption, um, assign permissions, how long till it expires, can they access it offline? And then those different permissions can be 
rolled out to certain people, authenticated users, groups or apps. And then what are those permissions? So I'm going to go in and custom. So if you're doing an email and maybe it has financial information or you're sharing, again, connection strings, and you don't want those to get printed, maybe you don't want connection strings to be saved, you don't want people to be able to forward that email that has that specific connection string in it, or Azure AD credentials. You can go in and say, this particular file, if it's labeled, if it has this particular sensitive information label on it, we're going to prevent forwarding or replying. We're going to prevent copying and extracting this information. Um, you can go in, click on learn more about permissions, but lots of different encryption permissions you can set, as well as when their access to this content expires. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's remove encryption, so I don't have to go set that up. Uh, Question before you move yeah. on from encryption. For the encryption to work right, the receiving party needs to have Office 365 in order to be able to open it? Not necessarily. Um, what will end up happening I'm they to have to. They, they end up creating a guest account. Permissions. You you end up if, if they don't they yet they have to create a guest account in your tenant right like a B two B account. Or so I would say for emails. The other thing I've seen like have you ever gotten an email from your bank where it's like you've gotten an encrypted message? Click here to go open the email. Mm -hmm. Um, if you send it to someone else's Gmail account and it's an encrypted email, they'll get that same type of thing. Click here to go open the email. And what it essentially does is it opens up that email in your tenant and they get that same type of experience where it's, we've emailed you a code to log in and view this email and they click, click, go copy and paste the code and then open it up in your environment. But then that, that creates a B2B account in your tenant, right? I don't believe it does anymore. Oh, um, they changed that, okay. I think that's new because I've also seen this happen. I was doing some testing with this um, actually with SharePoint the other day where my keyboard might be about to die on me here. Let me find a charger and if it reaches. Um, I saw this with a SharePoint environment the other day where you can do the same thing with sharing a file in SharePoint. And if you've ever seen the, um, you click it and it says, we'll email you a code so you can open it and log in. It actually let the user open it, type in the code, log in, and afterwards, I did not see a guest account in Azure AD. Mm -hmm. So it was doing some type of, it's not anonymous sharing because they still need the code and have to validate their email address, but it wasn't going and creating a whole bunch of guest accounts just for like a one-off share of a file. Mm. So they changed that, okay. So yeah, and I think the emails work the same way where they're it's not a it's not the whole guest account where it starts showing up with the pound ext pound all that in your tenant. Um, I think they're trying to get rid of that. People got tired of guest accounts, and it also, in my opinion, getting outside of DLP, but just from a pure security standpoint. If you start having guest accounts and you're doing sharing with like new and existing guests, it opens up a security a security vulnerability, in my opinion, for people to inadvertently assign permissions mm -hmm. to guest accounts that are already there. Um, because now you have 150 guest accounts from all these people that you just shared one file with that could accidentally be assigned other permissions to a whole site or added to a team or something like that versus we just did a one-off share. They don't have a guest account, so they can't just be somehow included in a group or get additional access um, as easily. Yeah, there's not an identity. And most people don't do the reviews on their guest users, which they should be doing. Yes. They don't. Oh, you're going to send me down a rabbit hole here. Sorry about um, that. No, because they changed all that too. With the identity governance one, I got an alert in my tenant the other day that features I used to be using as part of premium P2 are no longer included. 
They're included now in the identity governance add-on. That's yet another $7 per user per month on Jeez. top of the premium oh P2 gosh. license. That's one thing about working in the government sphere is at least you get all of them for stability because they take longer to change that stuff. Yes, I need to grab another keyboard a minute. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an annoyance. Um, but they are, I think they are, all that said, they are trying to get away from some of that always create a guest account stuff. Uh, so sensitivity labels continuing on. Content marking, um, if you want to start adding watermarks, headers, footers uh, to your files, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, based on that sensitivity label, go ahead and perform content marking. This is a new one. This does require, speaking of add-ons, this one requires Teams Premium if you want to go start setting up some of these Teams controls. Uh, but again, super beneficial, especially if you're doing things like um, uh, confidential meetings and you want to set up certain things around who can bypass the lobby, uh, who can record or not. So if you don't want presenters to be able to record, but only the organizer can record, um, they have the end-to-end -end encryption in here now. Meeting chat, this one can be kind of nice too. If you're if you're in education, I don't know if anybody here's in education and you don't want students to be able to chat while they're on Teams meetings, you could go in and start turning off the meeting chat or setting it up so that it's only available during the meeting. Um, from How does topic, that interact with the, the, the Teams policies? Because Teams policies can also control that. So this allows you to do it um, when you actually schedule the meeting. So let's say if you have meetings between teachers mm. or if a teacher is organizing the meeting and if it's a teacher to teacher meeting and you want to enable chat, they could then label it as a, uh, I don't know how you'd label it, but you could come up with a certain sensitivity label where this is a meeting between two teachers versus this is a meeting between teachers and students. So it gives you some flexibility now based on the label of what happens versus more of an all up uh, setting across the board. So, OK, so the way that I'm thinking that this would work is if you had a policy that said no meeting chat and you applied it to somebody and then you gave them a label that said a meeting chat allowed, they're not going to have that. But if you had it the other way around, where they were allowed meeting chat, but you had put a label on a particular meeting that said no meeting chat for this meeting, then it doesn't get allowed for that one. Correct. Oh, I assume it would work. Yes, that that should be how it would work. Um, I'm trying to think if I've actually validated that, but I'm with you in my head. The policy is always going to override the sensitivity labels. Mm -hmm. So you'd so want you'd have to open up the policy and then teach them on using sensitivity labels when they actually created meetings. It's basically giving them the ability to do what you would have to do as an administrator before. Yes. And to do um, it individually. OK. Yeah, a lot like it would work for when you do sensitivity labels for uh, creating teams, where if you mm -hmm. put a certain sensitivity label on a team, mm -hmm. you can start dictating if you have it wide open, but they choose a sensitivity label as internal only, you can remove the ability for them to um, Add, create. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, auto labeling for files and emails. This is a little bit more of an advanced feature, but this also you'll notice can apply to your blob storage files. If you're using Azure files, data lake storage, as you can now go in and start automatically applying labels uh, based on certain conditions. Um, so if the content contains, and this goes back to our sensitive information types that we created, if it contains a certain sensitive information type, go ahead and auto apply labels on files and emails. Go extend this out to Microsoft Purview data map. So files that even sit outside of Microsoft 365 also start getting these same types of labels. Uh, doo -doo -doo. 
Groups and sites, this is some of that privacy too, if you're going to allow external users in, if you want certain conditional access on those groups and sites. Um, so setting up privacy of teams and then going on to the schematized data assets is being able to go in and automatically apply certain labels on those data assets as well, um, if it contains some of those sensitive information types. So that is your information protection. Uh, kind of like was mentioned earlier, if you want this to go out to different people, these label policies will dictate when these labels are published or which labels are published and maybe who they're published to. They're published to this one's all exchange email, can use all of these published labels or if you have different subsets of users, HR gets these labels, legal gets another set of labels, IT gets yet another set of labels. Um, auto labeling is another way to go in. We looked at that already. And finally, all of that, then you have your data loss prevention. Um, a lot like the other one, this is going to give you an overview of what types of information is contained within different files in your environment, and now you can go in and start actually setting up different policies for how this gets shared. So I'm gonna I'm keeping an eye on time here. And I also have meetings. So we can go in and we'll just create a custom policy. And this is if you want to apply it to smaller groups of people, admin units. Think of admin units as like Azure AD's Entra ID's solution to OUs where you can group people into admin units and uh, allow different management controls at those admin units. Um, but now you can go in and start actually saying, where do you want to apply, apply data loss prevention? And it's not just even Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, but you can also do this to devices. If you're managing devices and you want to prevent uh, certain sensitive information from being copied to USB drives, copied over Bluetooth. You can set up DLP policies on devices. Defender for cloud apps allows you to extend some of these DLP policies out to things like Dropbox or S3 or Box or other cloud services that are not Microsoft related. Um, On-premises repositories, if you want to, if you have file shares, on servers that you want these to apply to. I'm going to go in and minimize these just to show some of the additional settings. So once you go in and say, where is this particular policy going to apl be applied? We said it's going to be applied at OneDrive, SharePoint, and Exchange. Now you can go in and start setting rules. So what is this condition? And this is where the sensitive information uh, starts coming into play. Um, the information types where we could say if the content contains those certain sensitive information types or those labels or those trainable classifiers that we created. So let's say we're going to use a sensitive information type and we're going to use an Azure AD uh, client secret, access token, user credentials, any of those, what the confidence is. Now, what do we actually want to do with that? Um, and this is going to be Azure creds. Let's go ahead and restrict the access. So are we just going to say we're going to block everyone? If anybody tries to send an email or share a file that contains any of this information, we're going to restrict access to everyone. Or do we want to say, you know what, internally, it's okay. Maybe we're a bunch of developers. We actually do need to share some of this stuff internally. But as soon as somebody accidentally adds someone outside my organization and tries to share a file with them or send an email to them with some of this information, we're going to block all of those external people uh, so they don't get that information. This is where it can also come into play with the data exfiltration. Somebody gets into your environment, finds all these files in SharePoint, tries to share them anonymously or share them with their guest account, this would actually prevent some of that data exfiltration because DLP would prevent those files from getting shared with them. Um, if you're in a case where they do need to 
override it. Uh, certain cases, you can do user notifications, notify users with a policy tip, um, and then also allow overrides but force them to require a business justification to do it or that they're explicitly acknowledging the override. Uh, and then finally, you can also go in and set up incident reports so that this automatically raises an incident with your admins that certain information was shared or somebody attempted to share it externally so that admins can go in and uh, take the appropriate action. So within this DLP rule, that was one, you can go in and create multiple rules within a single policy as well. Uh, so it isn't that you have to create a single policy for everything, is now you could also do connection strings in the same one and go in and do that same type of thing where now our content contains uh, a connection string information. Um, oh creating groups lets you do a whole bunch of things. Uh, you can look to at if it contains this and it's shared with certain people uh, is another policy. So these, this is one area where you can just go in and start exploring is what are all the different uh, restrictions you can put in place when it comes to data loss prevention. Once you have it, you can test it out. So you can start showing people policy tips, make sure it's working the way you want, Turn it off for now, keep it on. Next, submit it, and then it will go through and push this out to those locations. You can see this one, they do suggest adding it to Teams. So maybe you want to go in and add this to Teams conversations as well, so you can protect Azure AD credentials from being shared via a Teams conversation um, with external users. So we can go submit that one. It's in test mode. And it didn't like something in there. Uh, so those are going to be your DLP policies. This is alerts. So here's one that it picked up. One of my alerts where um, something was shared externally, a subcontractor agreement. Endpoint DLP settings are where you can go in and start restricting what that DLP stuff is. So creating a group of USB devices. So maybe you block copying sensitive information to all USB devices and then go in and set an exclusion of there's these five USB devices, very specific business cases where you want to allow copying to a USB device. You want people to be able to print to only internal printers. You don't want them to be able to go home, plug in their USB printer and print to that one. Uh, so lots of different endpoint DLP settings as well that you can go in and manage um, as you go through it. Uh, Activity Explorer, kind of like the other ones we saw, this is that same Activity Explorer that we saw under our um, and for our sensitive uh, was an information protection. It's up here under data classification. Uh, just another view to information explore. So that is kind of a summary. I know there's a lot there. It wasn't super Azure heavy, but hopefully you found it a little interesting. Um, if you have any questions or anything else, we have maybe five minutes left or so. Um, and always the self-promotion. If you do want to connect with me, um, feel free to email me, Mastodon, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, search for Ben Stedjink. I am the 